All right, there we go. That should be good. So let's sit tall. We'll close the eyes. And as always, we'll reaffirm our intention. The intention to be present. The intention to be open and contemplative. To inquire. To question. To receive wisdom. To be compassionate with self and others. To hold space. to reaffirm intention. I'm drawing the hands together in front of the heart. We'll lift our voices in one ohm. Breathing in. open. It's important to always acknowledge where these teachings come from. You know, I don't make them up. They're not mine. Um, They come from a long, long lineage, thousands of years old, from the area of the world that today we call India, um, by amazing individuals who had insights into life, who both dealt with the same or similar kind of day in and day out issues that we have, and just really wanted answers, as well as those individuals who decided to lead a different kind of life and perhaps went off in isolation in order to inquire about the universe at large. Um, And, you know, no matter what path it was that they walked, whether they were the path of the renunciate who went off and sat in the caves and in the forest, or, you know, the path of the teacher who stayed among the people and safeguarded the teachings... Whatever path, and and also, you know, lay people too, because even though you don't hear about them very often from back then, there were some. There were some individuals who were not considered to be renunciates, you know, who wore the orange cloth or um, or who were considered to be teachers, but they were still full of insight and they lent themselves to the betterment of humanity and to the alleviation of suffering. And so to all of those individuals, we thank them because without them we wouldn't be sitting here having this inquiry right now. So today's topic uh, is going to be a blend as it always is, um, but it's going to start off with a thought, um, something for you to contemplate as you go through day in and day out, asking yourself, what is balance here? What does balance look like here? in this moment. Because balance is not 50-50. Balance is not walking around life in a monotone kind of way, not reacting or responding to anything. That's not balance. That's being a robot. And that's not realistic for any of us. So in every moment where perhaps we're caught off guard or we sense our emotions coming strongly into play or we feel we're having a reaction. It's important for us to continually check in with ourselves and ask ourselves one very simple question. What does balance look like in this moment? Before I react, before I respond, before I... Whatever, you know. What does balance look like in this moment? That question in and of itself is the hardest question in the world to ask. Because we are, each and every one of us, so programmed to react. Somebody takes the parking space we wanted, we react immediately. First thought in the mind, that was mine. First thought. Like, you don't even think about having that thought, and it's there, right? If you're a parent and your child leaves, you know, I don't know, the empty milk container in the refrigerator or something, you don't even think about it. It's, it's, it's like a habit. You react. You're like, Come down here. Why is this empty milk container in the refrigerator? So that one question alone requires strength, willpower, 
resiliency, determination, intention. Just that one silly little question. What does balance look like in this moment? In the Patanjali Yoga Sutras, in uh, Pada 3, which is the Vibhuti Pada, it gives us a lot of hints, but there are two that I'm going to focus on. The first is that it's taught throughout yoga that we should let go, that we should release attachment. As humans, the first attachment that we try to release is to that which we don't like. And that's probably the easiest part because we just shove it away from us and get rid of it, you know, and we think that we've let go. But the reality is that shoving something away, avoiding something, getting rid of it is, is not letting go. Being at peace with the way things are and then making the conscious choice to step back, step away, or engage. That is letting go. Rather than the habit of reacting to the person who's taking your parking spot or you know the person leaving the empty milk carton in the refrigerator. Rather than reacting, we stop and we assess and we say, do I stay, do I go, do I engage, do I not engage, do I leave them alone, is this me? Is it them? Is it both? It's always both, you know. So basically, we stop and we say, what does balance look like here? But that's, again, it's come in full circle now, right? It's like that, again, is a hard question. It's not an easy question. And so we push things away. We avoid things. We stick them under the rug. We toss them out in the garbage. We delete them on Facebook. It's not the answer. It's not the practice. It's not. I suggest to you that if someone who tells you that they're, uh, you know, some kind of a, uh, a person who's going to guide you into a deeper sense of yourself ever says to you, yeah, I'm going through my Facebook friend list, deleting those people I've outgrown, I would not be sitting too close to that. Because that that is not letting go. That's judgmentalism. That is, that's harm, right? And that's not being with things the way they are. That's not being able to hold space. It doesn't mean that you have to make yourself vulnerable to other people's violent words and actions. Although there is a teaching that says, if you insult me, go ahead and insult me again. I I will not be affected by your insults because those insults aren't about me. They're about what you're going through in a moment. So my my Guruji would say, M-Y-O-B, M-Y-O-B, Suda, back in the day when I was Suda, M-Y-O-B, Suda, like, "Mm, buy your own business. (laughs) It's none of my business what you think of me. It's none of my business what you say about me. It's none of my business, you know. And when we can really say that, when we can really say that and and on some level really mean it, then we will also be able to say, what does balance look like here? But as long as we're invested in people liking us, in people approving of us, in people getting out of our way so we can have the parking spot, in people making sure that the milk carton doesn't get to empty so that we're not inconvenienced, as long as that's what we're concerned with, then we will not be able to stop and say, What does balance look like here? Because we'll think balance is somehow associated with satisfaction and easiness. Like if things are balanced, it's going to be easy. Right? Anybody ever think that? Be honest. Sure. Oh, man, everything is so out of balance. That's a fallacy. Nature is chaotic. Right? The storm is a balance. The storm in and of itself is a balance. Even though it's an inconvenience to us, the storm is a balance. The storm is nature. Nature is chaos. And part of the chaos is that sometimes there's a storm and sometimes there's a blue sky with a sun. And sometimes that blue sky and sun is beautifully perfect, right? 
wonderful day, 78 degrees and a little bit of a breeze, and other days that sun is scorching hot, giving you a sunburn. So, like, what is balance, you know? Balance is found in the chaos, and it's found in our ability to not react so drastically to it. When we react drastically, what we're doing is investing in our own suffering because the drastic reaction is going to lead to a sense of failure or a sense of dissatisfaction or a sense of inconvenience. It'll lead to anger, right? So, so we try not to react so much. And that might be the kind of the first step rather than, than you know, taking the bull by the horns and being like, what does balance look like here? Which is going to be really hard for us to ask that question. Maybe instead of that, we start someplace else and we say, what does my reaction need to look like here? You know, like, can I change just a little bit of my reaction in situations like this? We catch ourselves. We say, oh, you know what? I was really not nice to that person who took my parking spot. Um, that probably hurt their feelings. It probably contributed to their suffering a little bit. I wonder if, if this happens again, if I find myself in a fit of anger again, can I keep my anger at bay uh, just a little bit? Instead of, instead of you know, screaming at them, can I accept that I'm angry? Can I accept that I'm going through these emotions and accept my frustration and maybe not blame them for it? Because the reality is, they're just trying to go to the store too. They're maybe trying to get formula for their baby or medicine for their parent or food for their own belly, you know. That's the one thing. And the second thing is, my name is not written on that parking spot. And even if it was, it's still no guarantee. Because, you know, my English name is Sharon. How many Sharons are there in America? A lot, right? So... So nothing is guaranteed. So, so maybe we can begin by just asking ourselves about our reactions to things and looking at it and say, how driven am I by anger? How driven am I by passion? How driven am I by desire? How driven am I by, by egotistical want of satisfaction? How driven am I? And in those moments where I'm superbly driven, can I rein it in a little bit? Can I turn the temperature down slightly? You know, can I, can I just leave a little bit of breathing room? And that tiny little bit of breathing room will bring you something that is absolutely stunning and beautiful. It will bring you resiliency. It will prove to you in that moment that you don't have to react. Whether you accept that proof or not is going to depend on a lot of things. But in that moment, that's what you're learning. In that moment where where you just are making even the smallest attempt to change the reactionary state of being, what you're doing is proving to yourself that you can. And the more you do it, the more you will do it. And the more you do it, the more resilient you become. And the more resilient you become, the less you care about the parking space. Because you understand that the parking space was never about the parking space it was about one more inconvenience in life that you didn't want to have to deal with. But then, through these practices, through the breathing and the, the asana and the meditation and the concentration, you find that you're so much more resilient than that. That these little inconveniences in life that irritate us, they only irritate us because we have allowed that to become our habit. So... So we shouldn't begin thinking that letting go is about pushing things away or deleting people we've outgrown or anything along those lines. No, 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 no. Letting go, you know, one of the first steps is looking at what our reactions actually are and then making some, some very small choices, little tiny choices. They don't have to be grandiose. They can just be little changes here and there. You know, I'm not going to step on the spider I used to work in a law office. <clears throat> I worked in the law for many years. And this one law office, I was known as the spider lady. The spider lady. And so I had this one office mate who, whenever she saw a spider, it was the end of the spider. And I just sat her down one day and I said, could I ask a favor of you? Instead of doing that, would you give me 10 seconds? Just scream out my name. 
give me 10 seconds. So from that point on, she screamed out, Sharon, you've got 10 seconds. <laughs> I'd go booking down the hall with my little paper cup, scoop up the little spider and bring it out to the garden, you know. But in that exchange, you know, she found she had the resiliency to do something else other than kill the spider, right? So little tiny changes along the way. You don't have to kill the spider. You don't have to get angry over the parking spot. Um, If they've run out of your favorite ice cream, it's okay. You know, try something new. Build your repertoire of ice cream. You know, whatever it happens to be. And then eventually what happens is we we begin to see that instead of pushing things away, it's actually much more fulfilling to draw them closer. Not to attach to them in a way that, like, give me more, give me more. No, but that when they come to us, we we don't put that barrier up. We say, hello. Hello, anger, old friend. Hello, jealousy and envy, old friend. Hello, love, old friend. Hello, passion and desire, old friend. Hello, fear, old friend. Hello. I don't need to push you away. Instead, we can work together to resolve what needs to be resolved. And it might sound like I talk to myself a lot. I do. And I hope you do too. Because talking to yourself is the only way you're not going to be ignored. You're the only one who's really going to listen to you. I mean, really listen. Because even when you have a loving mother-daughter relationship, there are certain things the daughter will never say to the mother, and there are certain things the mother will never say to the daughter. Even if you have a loving spousal relationship, there are certain things the spouse will never say to the spouse because they love them and they don't want to worry them and they don't, you know, they they don't want to burden them. So so the only person who's ever really going to listen to everything you have to say is you. So talk to yourself quietly, out loud, however it happens to be, and let that be part of your hello. Check in with yourself. How am I feeling? How is this knee feeling? How is my foot? How's my back, my shoulders? How's this physical body feeling? Am I being grateful for this body today? Am I being grateful for this mind today? Am I using this mind in a way that is uplifting and healthy? Or am I using this mind and this body in ways that are not? Have that conversation with yourself, just like you would with your child, right? If your child is like a teenager, right? and are getting ready to go out. I mean, when when my kids were teenagers, boy, did we have talks. Yeah. (laughs) You know? But that's the kind of talks I have with them, letting them know, right? you got to talk to them about the birds and the bees and about, you know, the things that can hurt them and the things that can support them. But are you talking to yourself that way? Or do you just ignore yourself and say, oh, it'll, it'll work itself out, you know? So you say hello instead of, pushing things away. You, you meet everything as it comes to you, to the very best of your ability. And then you let it pass through. And this is the other side of it. So you don't push it away. You say hello. And then you let it go. You let it leave. You let it evolve, resolve, move along as it wishes to. When a life circumstance is done with you, and when it doesn't have anything left to teach you, it will go and become something else. It won't stay. It's, tr- it's true, right? It'll only stay as long as you need it to. So be a good student and accept the teachings of what life brings to you as best you can. In... Uh, chapter 3, as I said, the Vibhutipada of Patanjali, um, the Yoga Sutras, he states in there, the individual who can truly let go of even the attainment, that is the individual who will experience kaivalya. Kaivalya means freedom. So it's not enough to get rid of what we don't like. Right, that's not going to work. And it's also not enough to say hello. 
We need to learn how to stop pushing away, how to welcome, and then also how to not be attached to the things that we really like. Like the rewards, the attention, you know, the good jobs, the compliments. And we all like them, but we live for them too much. We live for them too much. We really do. And the more that we live for the compliments, the less willing we are to correct ourselves. The more we live for the compliments in general, the less willing we are to correct ourselves. Because we're afraid that if we acknowledge that we need to correct ourselves, then there will not be a compliment there. There will be an accusation of wrongdoing. As human nature. Does that make sense? Yeah. So in the Yoga Sutras, what Patanjali teaches us and what all the great teachers through time have taught us is neutrality. Not, not like, you know, being a robot, but neutrality. Whatever comes to me, I will welcome. Whatever leaves, I will respect. Whatever stays, I will learn from. This is freedom. Freedom isn't having everything go smoothly. Freedom is being able to remain unattached to the habits of the mind, of the ego, being unattached to the disappointments of life as best we can. It's not a perfect thing. You're not going to be like, I'm not going to tell you I was not attached to my knee being hurt, okay? That's, that would not be true. My knee was broken, I had surgery, and yeah, I was attached to it. But you know what? I constantly ask myself, where do, where's the balance in this? Where is the balance? What is this teaching me? What do I have to learn from this? Because it's not a waste of time. You know, some, somebody said to me one day, I don't remember who it was, but somebody said to me, they said, oh, it's so unfortunate that you have to sit in a chair for so long. You must feel like you're just wasting. And I said, oh, no, no, no. This is one of the greatest lessons I've learned in a long time. So much information here. <laughs> so much self-work. So much compassion. So much deeper. You know? Nothing is a waste of time. Nothing is for no reason. Everything is for a reason. So I digress. But when, when we can even let go of the things that we do think we deserve like the accolades when we can just put it this way when we can simply be a compassionate loving straightforward strong courageous to some degree version of ourself without it relying upon what anyone else has to say or not say it's in that space that we'll begin to know freedom. That's the space. Same chapter, same pada, um, number 24, Patanjali says, interestingly, before the other one, but he says, <clears throat> the yogi, through discerning practice, you know, through, through a sadhana that is consistent, becomes as strong as an elephant. And he doesn't necessarily mean physical strength. He means personality, character. He means that through your practice, you cultivate the kind of strength that is needed in order to stop and ask yourself, where, what, what does balance look like here? What is my reaction? How can I change my reactions? Where do I need that change? Where am I responsible for suffering? Where am I responsible for violence? Where am I responsible? And it's not the kind of responsibility that like gives you lashings, you know? Like I, I, to me, that's just the most kind of barbaric. You're not bad because you sometimes behave violently. 
You behave violently sometimes because you're hurt. That's why. You behave violently sometimes, and most times to ourselves, because we're scared, because we're fearful. So, so we don't say, you know, sometimes I behave violently, so I guess I'm just like no good. No, not at all. See, I behave sometimes violently because, because there's something that, that I need and I'm not providing it for myself. I don't know how. And maybe now I need to ask. Maybe now I need to seek out that help. Maybe now I need to look for guidance. Right? So it's not the kind of, <clears throat> of self-responsibility that comes with punishment. It's actually the kind of self-responsibility that comes with freedom. True freedom. Anybody in here ever have an epiphany in your life where once you accepted the responsibility, it was like, oh, stress off those shoulders. A certain kind of strong freedom came about you. It was like a relief because you, you understood, right? That's what happens. That's what happens. But as long as we, I guess we could say, as long as we keep our head stuck in the sand, and we keep thinking that pushing it away or pulling it toward us, you know, in some drastic way is the answer. Our head is just going to remain stuck in the sand and we're not going to know freedom. We're just going to keep looking for it somewhere and condemning it for not being right here that I can reach out and touch it. Freedom is not over here. It's here. So your sadhana is super important. Your practice. Now, what is your practice? We've talked about this so many times, but it's always worth talking about because repetition is the greatest teacher. The more we hear something, the more we're likely to understand it, to hear it in a certain moment, in a certain tone of voice, under certain circumstances, it'll open a window that wasn't open before. Would you agree? Yeah. Did you ever have somebody tell you something so many times and like you never heard it? Right, and then someone else tells you, so so funny little story. I had a student in one of our YTTs years ago, and it, there are certain things that we go over and over and over and over and over in the YTT. And like five years later, this young lady came back to me one day, and she said, "Suda." At that point, it was Suda. She said, "Suda, there's there's this thing that you can do in the practice and." Here, you know, there's this really great book about it, and I learned about this at a workshop last week, and I really think it'd be great if you put this in the training. And I just smiled and I said, Go to page five in your workbook. <laughs> <laughs> you know, but the window has to open, right, in order for the, the information or the teaching or the wisdom, whatever it is, to get through. And so, so we don't condemn ourselves because we didn't hear it the first 100 times, we just kind of giggle. Right? And we don't take offense that they didn't hear you the first hundred times. We just kind of giggle and we say, the window's just not open right now. But it will. It, in, it inevitably will. The right voice, the right tone, the right moment will come along. And, and boy, would I love to be a fly on the wall when that happens. Because it's a beautiful sight to see someone relieved. Right? It's a beautiful thing to see. So we don't push, push, push away. We don't pull, pull, pull forward. We just say, welcome, welcome. And then we do the best that we can to work with what we have in this life to what comes to us. And it's not to make it sound like it's all kinds of easy and it's going to be smooth. And if you do that, life will be peaches and cream because that's not the case. You'll scream, you'll cry, you'll stomp your feet, you'll make fists, you'll maybe hit a wall once or twice, you'll, you know, all, all of that will come forward still, still. Even when you take the moment to say, what does balance look like here? Inevitably, there's some, some habit that's going to come forward. There's some memory, some impression that's still going to drive you, still. But it's kind of like the scales, right? Right now, reactions is really heavy. And responses is really light. But the more that you learn about the differences between those two, the more that you make little changes along the way, the more those scales start to shift a little bit. Little bit, little bit, little bit, little bit. And then eventually, 
they balance each other out. I don't know that I've ever really heard a teacher say they've never been angry. You know, like, and I'm, I'm talking teachers like, you know, Thich Nhat Hanh or Amma or Swamiji, right? I've never heard them say, I don't get angry. I've never heard them say that they don't respond to life or react to things. As a matter of fact, I can remember quite a few times when Swamiji reacted to things. But even in his reaction, there was a beautiful lesson. I remember this one time he was reacting to a person. He was sitting in the the little kind of cafeteria at the ashram in India, and um, there was nobody else in there except for him, and maybe one of the cooks was there. He was eating his lunch, and I walked in not knowing he was there just to get a little cup of chai before class and um, and saw him and apologized for interrupting his lunch. And he said, sit. Said, Uh-oh. So I did. I sat, and he ate his lunch. Yeah. And I was like, oh, Swamiji, i got to get to class. And he was like, just sit. He finished his lunch. He cleaned up his plates. And then he turned to me, and he complained about this person. He said, why does so-and-so talk like that? It's like, they gossip, 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 gossip. They sound like an old woman. And I just sat there. And then he, he turned, he faced the way he was sitting. He took a breath, and he said, go to class. <laughs> <laughs> Do you know what I, I learned in that moment? You don't have to hold on to your reactions. He had a reaction, but he didn't hold on to it. He didn't hold a grudge. He didn't make that his judgment of the person. He had an observation. He shared it, and that was the end of it. He didn't go around to everybody saying, he didn't have to tell the story again and again and again. And so in that moment, even though it might sound a little strange, he really taught me a valuable lesson. He taught me that I am going to have reactions in this life, but I don't have to, I don't have to let them strangulate me. You know, I don't. I can just find the amusement in the reaction, find the lesson in the reaction, and then let it pass through. And if we did that more often for each other, think of where we'd be in this world. If we just held the space for things to pass through, now, mind you, I'm not talking about, you know, some, sometimes in today's world we get very um, sensitive because there's, there's a lot of physical violence. There's a lot of types of violence in the world. I'm not talking about sp- specific circumstances where someone is being physically injured, mentally abused. I'm, that's not what I'm talking about here. I'm talking about our day-to-day behaviors, tendencies, you know. If there's something more serious going on, then obviously there's something larger that needs to happen in order to bring about, you know, a, a level of wellness and okayness for an individual, whether that be counseling, support from the community. Right? Um, reflections or questions? Reflections or questions? Do a time check. Is this all making sense? Mm. It's not easy, though. And you've all, many of you, have heard me say that many, many times. It's not easy. It's not. But we do have to start somewhere. We can't just, you know, what happens when you go into a project with no plan? Like, does it get done? Uh, Maybe sometimes. But most oftentimes, no, what happens is you get frustrated and, oh, aggravated and you give up, right? So for your practice, for your sadhana, for your life practice, you've got to have a little plan, even just a little plan. It doesn't have to be a grandiose plan. You don't have to put on orange and go live in a cave. Not necessary. A little plan. And the little plan is, you know what? More and more, I'm going to ask myself, what are, what are my options for my reaction versus response here? 
there's certainly a moment you have before you step on the spider that you can ask that, right? Certainly a moment. And you just keep asking yourself. You go into to, you know, a restaurant and the waitress um, is super busy and it takes a long time for your food to come out. And so you have a thought in your mind, well, I'm going to leave her a really bad tip or no tip at all because she didn't get my food out to me in the time I expected it. Then stop yourself and say to yourself, could I have done any better under these circumstances? I don't know what her life is. I don't know what she's going through today. Maybe she, maybe she would benefit from a kindness. Maybe a small kindness would lighten her day because maybe she already feels horrible about herself because maybe she feels she's not working up to her capacity because she's working two stations instead of one. You know, certainly you have a moment to have that conversation with yourself. And importantly also, maybe the next time that you're looking in the mirror and you say to yourself, oh, man, there's, there's, another, there's another little crow's foot there. There's another gray hair. There's a this, there's a that. Maybe the next time that you look at yourself in the mirror and you begin to have a reaction to your own self, maybe, maybe there you can stop yourself. And part of your practice can be to recognize that teaching... Uh, I am not this body, and I am not this mind. Not really. I'm the energy that is housed in this body and that caused this mind to operate. I'm, I am the energy, the prana. This body is transient. It's not going to last eternally. This mind is transient. It's not going to last for the next five seconds. <laughs> right? It's true. So I'm, I'm not going to have a hate relationship with it. Because what am I having a hate relationship with? Change? Change that is inevitable? That makes no sense. What is eternal is the soul within you, the Atman. That's eternal. And this body is, is the vehicle of that soul. This mind is what is in some way, shape, or form feeding your relationship to that soul. So cultivate a respectful relationship with your body. Cultivate a respectful relationship with your mind. Don't do harm to yourself. And in, in doing so, in cultivating that respectful, healthy relationship, what you're actually doing is having a relationship with Atman, the truth of yourself. But as long as you cultivate violence against yourself, you will not know Atman. It's not possible. Because you're going to always be over there or over there or blaming that one or this one or reacting to something. And in the midst of reaction, we can't really know the truth. Because reaction is a... Yeah, it's not concerned with the truth. Reaction is like an avalanche. The only thing the avalanche is concerned with is getting going down the hill, down the mountain, in as fast and furious a manner as possible until it reaches the bottom. And that's it, right? So don't be the avalanche there. And don't be the sun that burns too bright. And don't be the reactor that becomes a bomb, an explosion. Find within yourself the ability to, to have a, a modest neutrality with the give and take where necessary. And what you'll find is that you won't have wasted so much of your energy on things that you can't do anything about anyway. So that the things that do matter to your health and wellness, you will have the energy to invest there. I used to be so tired. Back in the day, oh my gosh. It's like I worked in the law office. I worked 60, 80 hours a week. I was running here, doing this, doing that. 
you know, and just completely engulfed in, in my life at that point in time. And reactionary, reactionary, reactionary. And I didn't have time. I didn't have time to address my own suffering. I didn't have time. I thought I was, you know. I said, oh, check. I had a long list of checks. Yeah. And it felt really good to check them all off, too. But were they really being done? Were they really being addressed? Or were I, was I just checking off boxes? And my suggestion to you, and I know myself pretty well, is that I was just checking off boxes because I liked the look of it. Check, 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 check. Done. Next. Yeah. But then the day came. The day came where I couldn't lie to myself anymore. The day came where, where it was either stop or die. And I said, I don't want to die. Not like this. So I stopped. And I said, I got to address these things. I got to really check the box. And then it took 15 years to check the box. And it's still not really checked. But it's getting there, you know. Life is a process. But that required that I, I stop investing so much in my reactions to everything out there. And then I take some of that energy and I turn it inward. So that I actually had something to invest in myself versus just a want you know yeah and I think that we could probably all relate to that to some degree that there's been something in your life that you have just kept being distracted for you know, like I don't want to deal with that right now I don't want to deal with it I don't want to deal with it and a lot of times we do that and we don't even know we're doing it we don't even know but every time we do that, every time we allow ourselves to be highly distracted and we, we skirt our energy, we just throw it to the wind, <clears throat> basically what we're doing is we're, we're weakening our willpower, we're weakening our resilience, we're weakening our resolve, and we're weakening our faith in ourself and in anything else that we might claim to have faith in. So you got to rein it in. And that's really an important teaching in yoga, is that that one-pointedness. See, people think it's like one point is I got to sit in meditation and one pointed to the third eye center. <laughs> Whatever. Yeah, that's it's it's great. It, it's a practice, absolutely. But that practice comes later. The first one-pointedness is in your life. It's like it's you. That's the first one-pointedness. The first one-pointedness is you. And then once you have you know kind of your your understanding wrapped around that then you can worry about those other esoteric practices which i don't mean to make light of they're very important but they they don't matter if you're trying to do those and you're not doing your day to day then that's not going to do anything for you and as a matter of fact in some of the scriptures it says you shouldn't be attempting some of these things you know without having the proper preparation because it can be damaging to you to your psyche, to your nervous system. People want to go sit in meditation for, you know, 18 to 24 hours straight without ever having sat for an hour. It's a really great story. Um, there was a student who went to, and I might have told you this a couple weeks ago. If I did, forgive me. Um, there was a student who went to his teacher and he said, ah, oh, you know, I really, I want to become a meditator. I want to I'm really going to wrap myself around this now, so I'm going to go to the, this cave out in the Himalayas that I've heard about, and I just I need you to write me a letter of you know of, of introduction so that I can go there and um, and I'll be gone for a few weeks. And the, the guru said, "There's a very nice cave not too far from here. I'll write you a letter of introduction. I know the priest who overlooks the cave. Go there. Save yourself the airfare." go there he said oh okay absolutely so he goes off to this cave and he very enthusiastically gives the priest his letter of introduction and the priest says oh you know Swamiji sent you you can be here as long as you want come on go pick a corner in the cave have at it stay stay for as long as you like as long as you like it's wonderful to have people come here to meditate so 
the man walks in and he sees a little spot and he goes over and brushes it off and sits down and hmm, settles in and within about five minutes he's like these stones are hard now my back is tired it's chilly in here I should have brought a blanket hmm I wonder what they're doing at home Within like a half an hour, maybe an hour, you know, he's ready to leave. So he does. He just gets up and he's like, this isn't the right place. He goes back to Swamiji, to his guru, and he says, yeah, I'm, I'm, I really am going to go to the Himalayas and to that cave because this one wasn't the right one. And Swamiji said, hmm, there's one cave. It's the one here. And if you can't sit here, you can't sit anywhere. So, you want to go to the Himalayas? Go. But you're wasting your energy. Yeah. Questions, reflections, thoughts? Does it make sense? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. For those of you who are healing from injuries currently, I say just breathing a lot. (laughs) It's so important, you know. And for those of you who are, you know, healing from life right now, um, I suggest breathing a lot. <laughs> yeah, just breathing, breathing in and breathing out. There's that, that saying, you know, they say, you know, take three breaths before you respond or react. Just take three breaths. And it, rather than that, I, I like to marry that with something else. And the thing I like to marry that with is the, is the statement that 100% of everything will resolve itself without you. of everything will resolve itself without you. So take three breaths, repeat that to yourself, (laughs) and then whatever comes next is what you'll deal with, you know. But at least you'll have taken the moment to remind yourself that you have a lot more power than you think you have, and you have a lot more capacity to, to hold space, to be still, to have faith, to be less reactionary than maybe what you typically think you do. Yeah. You're welcome. So if there's no questions or reflections, then we'll sit up tall, close the eyes, take a nice breath in, a nice breath out. Repeat after me. 100% 100% of everything, of everything will resolve itself, will resolve itself without, me. without me. And that's okay. And that's okay. Draw the hands together in front of the heart. And together we'll lift our voices in one Om and the All Beings mantra. Take a breath in. Loka samasta suki no bhavantu Loka samasta suki no bhavantu Loka samasta suki no bhavantu Om shanti 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 Hari Om Shri Guru Bhyo Namaha Hari Om Hari Om Tat Sat Thank you all so much for being here today so lovely to gather with each and every one of you. May the rest of your day bring many moments of peace and contentment, happiness and joy, and whatever obstacles come to you, know that you're strong enough to stand with them, not against them, but with them. Enjoy. If you haven't eaten, uh, please enjoy a meal, and be sure to give some love to the kitchen staff. Yeah, they do such good work. Yeah.